Marketing Leadership Show with my little boy, Adrian Chenault. How are you, Adrian? I am good. So we are going to have a great show for you today. It is two-pronged uh, with what's going on in Washington, D.C., in New York City, obviously in Minneapolis, Minnesota. We did a little pivot, and at the back end of this show, we've got Troy Dooley and a guy named Andre Norman on the show talking about just exactly what we need to do to peacefully protest and not burn down buildings and get our point across without hurting anybody. And I'm really excited about that. But the front half of the show, Adrian fell in love with these people, calls me on the phone, telling me a story about it. I'm going to roll in my eyes because they're financial literacy and I'm not very literate. So <laughs> all of a sudden it dawned on me that uh, they knew somebody that I knew. So I called this guy named J.D. Mayotte, who I went to high school with. He's a stockbroker and he'd made a lot of money. Very, very bright guy. And he gave me the most rousing endorsement of these people that a person could possibly have. And he's a curmudgeon by nature. So that was crazy. So take it away, baby. Yeah, that's exactly right. It just proves I'm a very good judge of character. Yes, that's you are. I like to say. So uh, Lyle Donnelly and Daley Crom, welcome to the show. It's great to have you guys. Great to be here. Well, thank you. Yeah, and I mean, I think we have, uh, once again, I, we're, this is starting to become a, th a theme, I think, that we have kind of the parent-child in business together, taking on the world thing going on together, and that's pretty cool. Hello, father. <laughs> Hello, daughter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, that's, that's very cool. exciting. <laughs> and it's good, to, it's good to have your children. Actually, I mean, you live your life as a network marketer, praying your kids join you in business. But I think the chances of it happening are about a million to one because they see that you're working so hard all the time. You know, you're working day and night and the kids are going, I think I'm going to go get a good education and forego all that aggravation. <laughs> and uh, that's what you did for a long time until you finally smelled the Kool-Aid and came back and did a startup, which is even harder than the job you had, right? <laughs> Who would have thought? Who would have thought? Not a good judgment on that part, but we're having fun with it. So I met Daly through uh, a mutual friend that we had in common in you know, what I loved about you guys, and I'd love you to share about this is they, you know, you have an, you two as a family and, and the way that you came together ultimately in business, but you have an incredible story of why you chose the profession that you ultimately did. And, and I think it's something that we all can really identify with in normal times, let alone in the times that we're in now. And so Lyle, maybe to start off with you, you know, share a little bit of your background prior to what you do now and, and what led you to find this great profession. And before he goes there, Lyle is one of the few people I've ever known that calls Robert Kiyosaki Bob. <laughs> He's that close to Kiyosaki That's that, you know, cool. I still call him Mr. <laughs> I was hoping someday to graduate to Robert, but I never dreamt in a million years I would graduate to Bob. And I'm 69 years old, <laughs> so I have a feeling Robert's going to be the top of the mountain, but I'm in awe of you, sir. So go ahead. All right. So, you know, uh, what I found is... Um, how we all end up where we end up. You know, I know that Tom's got a story and, and Adrian, you have a story. The other's got a story. And of course, uh, we never, it doesn't seem like we ever end up where we end up on purpose. It's usually kind of by accident, right? So for me, I was in Longmont, Colorado. I built a, a very large uh, business in the construction industry. And in one year, I had a company that uh, didn't pay me about a quarter of a million dollars. It's a lot of money, kind of like, kind of a, a big hit for me. And that kind of set me on a different path. I was in my mid forties and I started looking around. And one day a guy came to my house to sell me some health insurance and he pulled up in a really nice car and he was dressed really nicely. And I was totally stressed out. I was so stressed out that I was having chest pains in my middle, mid forties. And he walked to the front door. I, I watched him walk to the front door and he looked like he had no stress in his life. So I said, now, before you tell me, your, tell me your policy, tell me about your life. I want to know everything there is to know. Cause I mean, I was looking, I was, I was in a, in a in a bad place, so he told me everything about his life, and uh, and I said, "How much money are you going to make this year?" He told me, "Not that money is everything, but I, I rate it right up there with oxygen. It's kind of an important thing." And um, I thought to myself, "This guy is going to make as much money this year as I am, but he's not killing himself to do it." So I kind of accidentally, divinely, somehow got into this industry. Did that for about seven or eight months, and I met another guy. I said, Lyle, you're, you're working in the wrong part of the industry. You need to get into the, this other part. And that was also divinely inspired. And then, I, of course, went to Kansas City to learn about the other part of the industry. And when I was in my late 20s, mid to late 20s, I had a mentor. My very first mentor told me that if I wanted to be successful at anything, all I needed to do was find someone that was really successful at what I wanted to do, and just, then just get them to teach me how to do it. So I started looking around the room when I was in Kansas City for a mentor. 
And there's a guy in there that had uh, 16,000 agents in 42 states. And I thought that might be my guy. So I introduced myself to him. I said, hi, I'm, I'm from Denver. I know you live in California. We're in Kansas City. But I just need you to introduce me to somebody that you, that you work with in Denver. He says, well, I'm sorry. I don't have anybody in Denver. So we shot the breeze for a little bit longer. And he said, you know, I'll come to Denver myself. I kind of like you. So he came to Denver 17 years ago. <clears throat> he was also, like I said, divinely inspired. He was also looking to do something different. So he and I and my wife got together 17 years ago and started this little company that we've, that we've grown, just the three of us. I had had some, some uh, background in the Amway business. That's why I know Bob, Bob Kiyosaki. I, was a, I, was, I had a pretty good-sized Amway business at one time. And my mentor had already been in this business for 21 years. So we got together, we started building, and now we have probably over 10,000 agents around across the country. So that's a, that's a quick, quick scenario of, of how it all came together. But, but it, was never on, never, it was never on purpose. It was just always some inflection point in our life that usually puts us on a different course. How right? cool is that? Yep. So you, you said something interesting, and you hear this a lot, and you know, I'm, I'm in a, a zone of, of trying to build a successful company, and so I'd love to learn from you on this, because it's, you know, a lot of people say, everybody knows you should you know, go find somebody successful to be your mentor and listen to what they have to say, but you know, everybody knows that. Not many people actually do it. And so what do you think, you know, what does it really take to set aside whatever predispositions and whatever, you know, whatever you think you know, and actually listen to somebody and follow their advice? Because I think we all kind of need that in our life. That's a great question. You know, <clears throat> Daly and I are still building our business. So we, of course, recruit people. And normally when I talk, and this is against, not against anyone that's listening, but when I, uh, whenever I meet someone that's over 50, I actually learned this from my mentor. I tell them, you know, you, you probably have about a one in a billion chance. I feel like I was lucky because I actually started, got into this business before I was 50. The reason that we, that we run into that situation, and so far, he has not proven me wrong. At least when I talk to men, that's kind of the way it is. A lot of times what happens to us is we allow our ego to get in, in the way. Always. And that just screws up the whole deal, right? Well, you know, I did this part. I've already done that. And I've done that. And I've done that. And But you're telling me I need to do all this stuff. Well, it seems like I've already done that in my life. I don't need to do that again. I just want to do this part. And that's why they fail. The other one is, uh, there's that one four-letter word. Mark? Oh, Mark. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the other part of the formula. You have to be basically being willing to do whatever it takes. Yeah. Did you see the bit? Did you guys see the live I did today with Robert, with Richard Brooke? Uh -uh. I haven't. Yeah. You, did you see it daily? I saw that you were on, but I was jumping okay. into another. Yeah, he was oh. unbelievable. But he said, we in the profession sell it like it's not work and that you're going to make money fast. And what's so crazy, it's exactly the opposite. But people fall for that every day. They go off the cliff and they get mad at network marketing, not the moron that told them it was easy and not work. That's and right. if we would just tell people, this is the hardest thing you've ever done in your life, but the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow truly exists. And what I love about you guys is that the financial Kiyosaki going back to Kim Kiyosaki and Robert Kiyosaki, their entire life is financial literacy. Yours is the same way. You learned it, you taught your daughter and you're teaching the world and we're, and he's teaching me <laughs> and it's working out. So it's very, very smart. I, we're, we're all over that. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a hundred percent true. And you know, I think for, for so many of us, when you're trying to build that successful thing, you know, really understanding that you don't know what you don't know. And I think especially, I don't know if you agree with this, but as, you know, as you go, I came from a corporate background, you know, I, and I want to talk about this on, on after the first break daily about your perceptions of this and maybe we can kind of compare notes, but I, I had this total preconception of, like he said that, you know, he was around, but I always saw him on the phone because I actually saw him working at our house instead of just disappearing someplace. And so I was like, I don't want to do that. I want to do this corporate world. And so I went into the corporate world. I spent 10 years there. I had a pretty successful career, but you come back into this world of whether it be uh, financial literacy or you know traditional network marketing or whatever it is, you have to unlearn so much of what you what worked in that world doesn't work over here. And so even when you find people who've been really successful someplace else, there's a lot that they have to like reset their brain, don't they? Absolutely. You're absolutely right. Resetting your brain, that's a great way to put it for sure. Yep. Yeah. Daily, how's it been working with your dad? 
I know you have got two beautiful children. You and your husband are in the same neighborhood as your parents and you love what you do. And it's a joy every day because of the lives you're changing, right? It is, it is. I, um, I'm not gonna say it was easy. Uh, it was work. It was a, I had a conversation with somebody earlier today that found out that I actually, that he's my dad. It's not something I come out and say right away. I let it be like the little hidden secret, but um, it was it was a challenge to kind of figure out how, how do we do the family life and how do we do work life, that work life balance. But then also it is past the work, it is so rewarding. And then this, this piece of being able to just help people understand that money doesn't have to be hard. It can be really easy. Um, we're just all conditioned that it has to be hard. We grow up just learning from our parents being stressed out or whatever it is that money's hard, it's difficult. And then we're conditioned from work that we're supposed to do something. And all of these letters and numbers that come with with money are hard to understand when in fact it can be really easy and really rewarding. And so I think that um, being able to step into a position to be able to help people and go into a financial place with people, that really intimate piece of their life and be able to take that financial fight out of a household is so rewarding. And to be able to give people that, that is just, it's been great. And to be able to, you know, travel with him and work with him and, and my mom has just been such a, such a gift. I think inherit from him is going to be also pretty important. So <laughs> anybody like him, Adrian, when Adrian got married, he thought about taking his wife's name. So he was going to be able to, it was unbelievable. So let me ask you that. Okay. So how do people get a hold of you? Uh, they can, we can, you can call us. Uh, okay, what's your phone number? My phone number is 303-621-4243. They can we'll reach put, out via email. Uh, which is daily.crom at fiveringsfinancial.com. You cool. can do the same for Lyle as well. You should probably spell that for him. Oh, uh, that's five, F-I-V-E. No, daily. Oh, daily. <laughs> that's not the hard part to spell. <laughs> D-A-L-E-Y okay. dot crom, K-R-O-M, and then five rings financial is all spelled out. Beautiful. All right, we're going to take a little break. This is the Network Marketing Leadership Show. We're coming back right after this. And we're back. Right, we did it. How you do? Okay. <laughs> oh man, you guys are great. And I love the little teamwork of it. You yeah. Know, I wish we got all along that well. I wish we did too. So take it away. <laughs> I baby. think maybe if I change my name, things would go better. Yes. <laughs> Adrian Crumb. Uh, so, uh, so part of how we connected, that how Daly and I connected was really around contact mapping because what she was doing, and I want to talk more about some of the mission that you're on Daly, especially around educating women specifically when we're back on the big radio so that the, the full audience gets to hear about it. But, you know, you guys are you across everything that you do your whole business you're spending a ton of time connecting with people learning their stories and being able to connect the financial education the products that you offer all that stuff to what they what you know what they need and and their story and their pain points and and their needs and so just talk a little bit about how important it is to learn and to be able to remember people's stories as a way to be able to to go and create a successful client relationship it's um, your name is the most important uh, word you will hear all day, right? Is somebody yeah. hearing their own name. And so we're not only knowing their name, but knowing their face and remembering their story. I love hearing women's stories. One of the things that was a draw to me is that our, our company is 60% women. And I can mention that again, but um, I love connecting with women. It's that heart piece, that emotional side of money piece. And putting a beautiful face to a beautiful name is so, so important. And so your contact mapping, when I heard about what you were doing and the mission that you were on to make things easier for all of the people out there building businesses and networking and doing all of the amazing things. And even when we were talking in your office over coffee about just parents, you know, in the school line, because we're both parents, young children, it was like, oh my gosh, I can never remember little Johnny's mom's name, but I know little Johnny. So it was so great to know that that you came up with this product that could be so helpful for people. 
Yeah, thank you so much. And I'll tell you, uh, we need to, there's some some exciting things that are happening that are not quite oh, public. So we can't that. even say them on the radio yet. Big stuff but happened. there's, uh, yeah, there's some even more exciting stuff that I'm going to have to fill you in on after the show. But, you know, thank you for saying that. And it's so true. It's like in every area of our lives, people just want to be cared about. They just want to be remembered. And, you know, little Johnny's mom in the school line might be your next, you know, diamond person in your business because you didn't have an agenda. You just took enough time to actually learn somebody's name, to learn their story and just to love on them. And all of a sudden they go, you always seem to be in a nice mood and you drive a pretty nice car. What the heck do you do? And, you know, now, now the whole, the whole table is set. Right. And so that's really what contact mapping is about is being able to do that without an agenda where you really love people and where you learn their story and then you have whatever business you're in you have a toolbox of whatever it is that you have to offer and you're just connecting their story to what you have to offer or loving them enough to know that if they aren't ready for what you have to say that you're not going to do it right and so what you need to do right now is go to contactmapping.com and you get to go and dive into this thing completely free and it's going to blow your mind so head over to contactmapping.com get going and you will thank me later. I promise. Stick your toe in the water and you will be swimming. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're coming back and welcome back. It is the network marketing leadership show with Tom Chenault, Adrian Chenault, Lyle Donnelly and Daly Crom. Right. Well done. Thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, I just love these. I love these daughters and sons of successful people carrying it on because it's never going to stop. But, you said something really important when you said 60% of the people in your company are women. And I am around all the time because I'm old and I hang around with old people where the <laughs> husband has died and the women have no financial literacy. And they're trying to get up to speed on all that stuff because they had it in their husband's hands and all of a sudden he's gone, either by a divorce or unfortunately death. So talk about that a little bit because you're actually getting people ready for life. With, with, you're paying people with commissions to get ready for life, right? We are. It's cool. Go ahead. So, uh, probably 15 years ago, uh, since my wife was part of our business, you know, my, Mike and I started the business with my wife. And if, if it had just been Mike and I, he, we're almost the same age as you are. I'm just a couple of years behind you. It, our, our business would look like every other financial business in the country, male, pale, and stale, pretty much, right? <laughs> But since my wife was part of the business, she started attracting other women. And then we started doing some research and we found out that 63% of all the financial wealth or all the retirement wealth in this country will be in the hands of single women by this year, 2020. Wow. Either, either divorced women or, or single women, yeah, either divorced or widowed. So we found out that they would much rather talk to another woman because somehow, some way they, they, they communicate differently than we do. So they'd much rather talk to a woman than a, an old guy like me. And the other thing we found out is 83% of, of all financial decisions made every day in the United States are made by women. And the smart women, the smart women let their, their husbands think that they made the decision. So that's, uh, so we actually did this by, not, I guess by accident, but also on, uh, by design. We, we, uh, we also found out that women are much more loyal than, than men too. So. One of the things that we do to help women is we host um, all of the education we do for folks is free. So they can join any of our classes. We host a Money 101 class, which is like a little 30 minute, you know, little class. But then we do a uh, class called Wine, Women and Wealth. And that's where it's a really safe place for women to be able to come in and network and meet other like minded women in their community that they feel safe to ask those scary questions. Women get a little nervous around talking about money. And unfortunately, we stick one of you men in the middle of the room, they're not gonna talk. Um, but you give them a little glass of wine and some munchies and they are more than happy to meet new friends and talk about money and really empower themselves and ask those scary questions. And what's really cool, and a little self plug here, but um, there was a book called Wine, Women, and Wealth that was written last year by a whole bunch of women here in our company that are hosting Wine, Women, and Wealth all over the country. And it is the stories of women that have come to one of our events or um, worked with us personally and some of their success stories. So you can grab that on Amazon if you want. What's the name of Wine, Women, and Wine, Wealth? Wine, Women, and Wealth. Cool. That is really, really cool. And, and you're so right. I mean, you know, the, the unfortunate reality is 
you know, back to ego, Lyle, you know, most, <laughs> most of us men, we don't know anything either. And we're really not, a, we're really not willing to admit it. And so, you know, creating that kind of forum where it's a safe space, I, I commend that for women. I think it actually needs to exist for men too. And, it, you know, it's probably harder to get men to admit that they don't know, but we all, you know, we all need that help and that support. And I just, I think it's really admirable that you guys are doing that. And, you know, again, you know, we, in normal times, we need this in uncertain times, which we are certainly in pretty uncharted waters right now. We need it even more. And there's, you know, you're, you're able to touch a lot of lives even more than ever in a time like this, I would imagine. Absolutely. Yeah. So what do you, you know, daily as a, a young, you know, a, a mom of young kids, you know, surviving during <laughs> them being home and working this, you know, just talk about how this profession has been a, a gift to you, I would, I hope, and I would imagine being able to, to weather this, this time when you don't have the structure that you're used to and how that might inspire, you know, other moms out there to, to check something out like what you do. Yeah, I think what we do is super powerful, not only just for women, but for everybody. The unemployment rate right now is just astronomical. And in fact, our company is growing. And the reason being is because that we get to work with people on a part-time or dual career basis, which means not only if you're part-time or dual career, but if you're a mom or a dad or a grandma that stays home and just needs a little bit of extra income. So our company is growing astronomically right now because of that. And Honestly, for me, it, we haven't skipped a beat. I've actually gotten busier because of the pandemic and all of the craziness that's going on. And the other gift that I have is that I have, I have great mentorship and people in my life that I can trust and wonderful leaders, but being able to be a mom and I'm telling you, all those mamas and daddies out there homeschooling, I, I get you. Um, I, it was definitely a challenge, but, um, being able to make my own schedule and teach my kids and then be there now for the summertime to, to do what all, whatever I need to do now because there's not summer camps is going to be fantastic. And my income is growing, it's not going down and I don't have to rely on a stimulus check or an unemployment check. I just know that I can rely on myself because of that four little word called work. Beautiful, well, you guys, thank you for coming on. And we are out of here. We're going to come back right after this. Thank you very much, Genesis Communication Network, for having us. We've been on 12 years with you, and we appreciate oh. you. We're the Network Marketing Leadership Show. We will be right back. Awesome job, you guys. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was really cool to see your story and just the way you guys, you know, the, the so love and the classy partnership people. that you have together is really, really cool. Thank well, you. Thank you, guys. We'll take off so Andre can have the floor. Yeah, you're going to love the back half of the show, so make sure you watch it on Facebook yeah. because this yeah, Andre well. Norman is, when you buy his book and you learn more about this guy, he came from the wrong side of the tracks and turned it around and is changing the world. And I saw him on Michael Burnoff's podcast yesterday, and he literally made me cry. And I reached out to him an hour ago when all of a sudden it dawned on us, well, you should do something. And the guy dropped what he was doing and came on the show. So Lyle and Daly, this is Andre. Say hi to everybody. Hi, Andre. Andre. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Great to meet you. So be sure you watch the show and Definitely. do a commercial. We got to make some money. Yeah, how about that? <laughs> Yeah. So uh, actually, so the, what, a, a timely announcement. So this Thursday, we are doing a webinar for contact mapping. And what we'll be talking about is how to do social media in a way that is not just this constant sort of yammering on and trying to look a certain way and do this attraction marketing and all this kind of stuff that certainly has a place. But what I think the missing piece of the puzzle is that you're doing too much talking and not enough conversing. And so we're going to do a webinar where we're going to give you a tool set that applies not just on Facebook, but on LinkedIn and across all social platforms about how you can be doing a better job of generating the right kind of conversations on social media. And it's going to be awesome. So it's on Thursday. Uh, it's at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. You can go register for free at contactmapping.com slash webinar. And if you can't watch it live, you'll get a link to watch it on a replay. So don't worry if you are in Australia and that is 2 a.m. So 
we're excited about that. And uh, this is going to be awesome. I'm really, I'm, I'm jazzed. And Andre, I will do a proper intro on the show, but it's awesome of you to, to come on here on such short notice. Thank you for being There's here. There's no it's such nice thing as short notice. When friends call, you show up. Amen. And I'll never forget the first time I met him. He was in Arizona someplace. And I said, when do you want to get together? He said, I'll come over. I'll fly to Colorado today. And that was like two, three years ago. Wow. And uh, that was so cute. I save every phone number through this contact mapping that he's got. So all I did was call him up. I said, you remember me? He goes, heck yeah, burn off. I said, yeah, let's talk. And five seconds later, he's on the phone because he's committed to changing the world. And we love you for that. Tough times out there, right? Andre, could you turn your volume up? He's he's really quiet. Sorry. How's that? I wasn't saying anything. I know, but turn it up more. <laughs> we got you now. That's beautiful, buddy. <laughs> okay, and I'm not able to hear get Troy in for some reason, so we're we're working on it. He's had the link. Can you hear me now? How's that? Perfect. Yeah, you're good. We got you, baby. This is going to be fun and important, man. What do you think is going on? Do you think it's going to get worse over the next few days as far as the rioting goes, or the demonstrations, or it's going to keep going for for some time. Yes. Yeah. Well, you're, you can, you know, you're on AM radio. So know that part. So it's not a podcast. Okay. So there are some FTC laws around it, language and things like that, that I know doesn't matter, but I just want to say that, but there's nothing you can't say. And what we want to do is get people to peacefully demonstrate and love each other and have network marketing in this culture of network marketers understand that we can be the solution is my whole goal here. Gotcha. All right, cool. Aren't you excited? I'm really excited. I think this is an incredibly important conversation and I'm, I'm glad that we're doing this. And we'll have Troy Dooley in a second. Okay. Now they asked me to turn the mic up again. Is that again or is that not again? You're good. You're perfect. Just like that. Okay. Oh, turn it up again. She said, that's, I think that's about as loud as my mic goes. Okay, that's crazy. Good. All right, we're going in 20 seconds. <laughs> very, very exciting. Thank you for being here. And your book's at Andre Norman, or is it on Amazon? It's on Amazon. Oh, man, I don't, and the name of it is? Ambassador of Hope. Ambassador of Hope. Beautiful. It is type my name in Amazon. It'll come up. All right, cool. All right, everybody, we are back. It is Tom Chenault. It is Adrian Chenault. It is the Network Marketing Leadership Show. And we decided to do a pivot when we started watching the news. And all of a sudden it dawned on me. I saw I got a I got a cover photo from a guy named Louis Ariaza of a beautiful heart with a black background. And I thought, you know, that's exactly what we exemplify, but we need to talk about that. So the poor people that were on the show on the front end, we're going to be there the whole show, but I cut it in half to get Andre on here, Andre Norman and Troy Dooley. And Troy Dooley is one of the big voices of network marketing all over the world. He's kind of like a, he's one of those guys that calls it as it is. He's a former Marine, uh, unbelievable, loving, unbelievable human being. And, uh, he and I got, well, actually me, a guy actually really, really called me on a face, out on a Facebook Live the other day as being somebody that uh, might have been a little bit racist, and it wasn't true. But then I started getting a deeper dialogue with somebody I love a lot, and they were talking to me about microaggressions. And this individual said, uh, you need to look at the way that you, look at the words that come out of your mouth. And I go, what's that mean? She goes, microaggressions. And I go, what are you talking about? She goes, you think you're funny a lot. You know, you're not, you're mean and you're racist and you're sexist and all those things that you think you aren't, you are. And I want you to go read this book and I'll get the name of the book, but basically, I can't think the of the name new, of the new Jim Crow, the new Jim Crow. By Ale and, and Michelle Alexander. Yeah. So I, she got, she, this individual sent me that book on, 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 on audible and I'm literally reading it with this person to become a better man because I don't even know what's coming out of my mouth. And I don't think 99% of the people, because we are preconditioned to have that little biased twinge. And I don't want that twinge. I want to be a loving human being. So Andre Norman is with us. Go to andrenorman.com. He just wrote a terrific new book that he'll show you in a second. We've got Troy Dooley with us. 
who's never written a book in his life, but everybody knows who he is. And here we go. So what do you say, Troy? I mean, you, you were on you, you were actually a target of that same Facebook Live, just not at the level I was. Uh, it was hurtful and it didn't feel very good. And I watched it and I was all self-righteous until I started looking at it. And I thought there's a modicum of truth there. And that individual that did it had no right to say what he said. But at the same time, he had a right to say what he said because Tom Chenault's wired that way a little bit. What do you think? Well, you, you definitely are wired to say what you think. You've always been that way the whole time that I've known you. Uh, but at the same time, that's in private and public. You're not different in public than you are in private. That's the one thing I've seen because you've called me things in public and then called me the same thing in private. So, I mean, it's just the way you are. However, I wrote about this on Facebook today because most of us act as posers. We, 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 either, we either pretend we're something in public that we're not, whether we're tough men or we're little wussies or whether, whether we want to spout out something that's, that's hurtful or act like we're all lovey-dovey. And you, and you can see this. I mean, in some of the, the critical time we're going through right now, you can go over and look at certain people's Facebook profiles. And if they're not under stress, they talk about peace and love and rainbows and unicorns. But then when you go look at what they've written inside of a post, they're anything but that. And yeah. I don't think they're bad people. I just don't think they even realize the microaggression that, that gets exacerbated because of the baggage we all carry. What do we do about this, Andre? Well, there's a difference between being aggressive and being rude or being direct. Yeah. I'm extremely direct. So I often get called um, arrogant because I'm direct and I'm right a lot. So <laughs> for a lot of people, I'm arrogant. But if you ask them, was he right? They'll say yes. Did he tell you factually exactly minus the BS? They'll say yes. But to somebody who's not really ready to have that type of conversation, I'm deemed aggressive and I'm deemed arrogant. And I just, I mean, I'm not trying to dance around. It's your perception. Now, when you get to races, that's talking about, you don't like me because I'm black. Now, you can say some things that are insensitive. You can say some things that are out of line. That doesn't necessarily make you a racist. It might make you insensitive. It might make you not caring. But racist is, I just don't like you because you're black. I don't like you because you're white. I don't like you because you're Latino. That's different for me than just being, I'm saying, maybe a Jericho rude. Yeah. I'll go along with that. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and, and I think the the moment that we're in right now, it, you, I think it, it's the good the good that I hope is coming from this and, and I think is coming for me personally is that I think this thing has gotten big enough that it's, it, I think it's touching every one of our lives and it's having us step back and go, okay, what, you know, what role, even if I don't feel like I am touched by this in a personal way because of the color of my skin, because of the place that I live, because I don't live in Minneapolis, Minnesota, or Los Angeles, or places where there's a lot of stuff going down. I, we all, we, this is a, a conversation that impacts every single one of us, certainly in the United States and, and probably well beyond that as well. And so I, I, I'm, I'm finding that people that normally don't engage with this topic in conversation are engaging with it. And I, I think that's a good thing. I'm aware I'm a better man than I was two weeks ago. I'm actually 90 days ago. This pandemic has really, really got me to start thinking about things and rigorous self-inquiry. This whole thing with this unbelievably horrible shooting down in Florida with the police officer who got that guy. And then this thing up in Minneapolis, I'm looking at it going, you know what? this has got to end. We've got to start loving people, don't you think? I mean, I'm a firm believer that the more people in discussion, the better. And the first thing that happens, I've been having a lot of discussions. I have a lot, I have white family. I mean, they're not, Michael Bernard's not a friend, he's family to me. And yeah. I can give you a list of people who are family to me. And if folks don't like it, too bad. Because when I was in my lowest point, my family stepped up. And not all black people stepped up, not all white people stepped up, but the people I call family stepped up. So I'm having a conversation like, Dre, why the looting? Dre, why the violence? Dre, what? it gets to the point, there's two things. When you've been historically killed, tortured, beaten, sold, whatever you want to call it, 
at what point and do you do something and what does that look like? So I'm, I don't believe in looting. I don't believe in you hit me today. Someone go down the street and punch somebody else tomorrow. But for the people who don't have that sensibility or that insight, what do you tell a person to do in response to being killed? That's, that's the dilemma. We don't agree with looting. We don't agree with destroying property. We don't agree with attacking people across the board. But now what are we going to, you tell me, Tom, go tell them black folks and the white folks who are supporting them. And the guys who are out, this is what they need to do. And I'll go to the street and bring that message. I can go on the street in real time, but there's not a message going forward of what they need to do. or they're doing what comes to mind or they're doing what's being presented to them. They're doing what's an option to them. Even though they know it's wrong, they don't have a right thing to do that's equally acceptable. What do you think of that, Troy? Uh, well, I, I got a question on, right, because I grew up in the 60s. So I, I got to, and I grew up in Kansas City. So I saw the same type of, of anger, the same type of, of explosion then. And I saw the aftermath of that. I, I remember watching the Watts riots and, and great people who are on the same side of the cause are living in these areas. And some of these areas to this day haven't totally come back. How can we, not just as white people, but as Americans, how can we help people to understand, look, you're not just hurting other people. You're not just causing a, a large conversation you're hurting the people that you love how can we help that situation because that's the part i still have confusion on i don't know what message to bring when i'm seeing good people being hurt in the same communities by people that are saying i want to protect these people that's my confusion maybe as a white guy i mean i'll be honest here that may be i just haven't lived it, it, it can you help us understand this is not about protection. This is about being fed up. Okay. People in the streets right now, it's not about protection. It's not even about honoring George Floyd. It's about being frustrated, fed up, and the rest. If that was your child in the street and you watched your child die on video, you're not trying to be logical. You're not trying to be sensible. You're going to be enraged. And so what you have is an enraged community that's not making sense that's not using logic, that's not following any structure or pattern. And it doesn't matter you've ever, if you've ever gotten mad at home and kicked something over in your own house. I know people who broke their own phone. I personally have never done it. They got mad and slammed the phone down. That's your phone. You gotta buy a new one. But when you get so emotional and you get so upset, you might smash your phone. You might slam a door and those things belong to you. So right now, the community is so upset that they don't care or they're not focused on what they're breaking. I just need to break something. And that's the mindset. So it's, it's not about protection. It's not even about right or wrong. You go back to, to the original time when we got off the boat, tortured, killed, uh, made to work, sold, hung. You get out of slavery, you get to lynching, the whole Jim Crow era, just, just hanging black people for fun or whatever the cause was. And people would literally stand around and watch lynchings. Went on for a whole decade, whole generation. Passed to that, and you just keep going forward. Now we get to Rodney King, which wasn't the first. It was just the first for America. Then you get to all the rest of the names. I'm not saying right or wrong, but as a person watching this, watching that man die on the street Sickening. wasn't much different than watching the old lynching movies. The only difference is it's 2020. Amen. I'm watching a, a live lynching in 2020. And there's five police officers standing around helping if there was an antenna or not, doesn't matter. I'm going to the end result. Understand. It was all bad ending. So as a black person, I'm thinking, oh my God, is this is this Jim Crow 2020? Is this slavery 2020? Well, you can just take me out and kill me for writing bad checks. Take what me about to court, send me to jail, but death on a sidewalk for bad checks is tight. That's that's a tough one. It's sickening, and you're correct. It's been happening forever, and it is pent up rage for generations. And what we've got to do is understand that, hear these people, listen to them, so they finally feel like change is absolutely going to happen, however slow. It's going to take a long time, 
but we've got to start listening because we have hurt those people forever. And it's just those people, not, not anybody got, that's oppressed, not just, no, that wasn't a descriptor. No, no, no. It's I got just wrong. The, it's going to take a long time is the wrong. I, I'm cool with these people, those people more so than it's going to take a long time. We can, we want change. Change now isn't it's fixed now is we stand up now. Good. Go There's a that. difference between change now and it's completed now. When you say, I'm going to build this mall, it, you buy the land, you break the ground, that's the starting of the project. But you stood up. Everybody stood up and said, we're going to build this building. We're saying, hey, let's cut the ribbon. Then we, can, the we ribbon. can talk, we can have a celebration when the building's done. So right, we, we want to take change a break. Now. We got to take a quick break. So we're coming back right after this. It's the Network Marketing Leadership Show with Tom Chenault. Adrian Chenault, sponsored by contactmapping.com. We'll be right back. Awesome. And we're back. Good golly. Good conversation. Yeah. But people need to communicate and talk and love one another and stop with all the sound bites and the social media and figuring out what we can do to drive some each other. Want to be famous. Some What's that? Want to be, some people just want to be famous. They think this is their chance. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It's scary. Yeah. One is, you know, I think one of the bit you know we, there's all this pent up rage there's all this you know there's there's all this stuff happening out there and people are really hurting and people that you know people around us people in our community people that we care about are hurting and i think one of the things that we that those of us who care and those of us who are paying attention can do is is to really go and listen to people's stories and really to take the time to reach out and and ask somebody how they're doing and to not be afraid to do that. Because I think sometimes like, uh, you know, I'll say this personally that, uh, you know, as a white male that you're, you're so afraid of saying the wrong thing that you don't engage the conversation. And I think that's the wrong thing to do. I think that you, if you care about somebody that you show up in love and you got to listen to them and, and actually be willing to maybe step in it because, and, and just say, I don't know what I don't know, but I care about you. And that's why I'm here. Andre literally said, kiss my ass, Tom. It's not going to take a long time because he's straight. He said it nicely and he meant it. You know, it's not going to take a long time. It starts right now. You get the first shovel, break the ribbon. It may take a while to build that mall, but you start now. And we've been waiting to start now for literal generations saying it's somebody else's job. And finally out on the streets, it's nobody else's job, but our own. Troy, you're dying to say something. What were you going to say? I am because... What, what, what Andre said just triggered something. For decades, women went through the same kind of crap, not from death, but from rape, from abuse of power, all this. We just saw the Me Too movement take a giant push forward when, uh, when, when finally one person came out and said, stop. So, so should we take that same forward motion with racism and say, okay, enough is enough we've started with the women now we're going to start over here with racism black right yellow red i don't care what it is and stop it because i think that's we we have placated it sometimes i think as a white guy i got confused and i'm going to tell you andre you might be able to help me on this one i watched an abuse of power i watched somebody kill somebody and i saw this country say no and then all of a sudden when we saw the, the rioting side, not the protest. We were all in the, when we saw the rioting, all of a sudden I, I took a step back because it's like, well, wait a minute. I didn't know this was about racism. I was looking at it as this cop was a jerk and he needs to go be put away. And then all of a sudden it became about racism. Is every white black cop situation racism or, or how do we, how do we, how do we work with this part of it? Because I've got a lot of white guys they get freaky and I'm trying to work through that with them. Okay, hold it. Hold hold the answer, Andre. Troy just did a tremendous job of talking completely through the break about the radio show. Great job. Now, <laughs> so here we go. We got to come back on the radio. That's awesome. Too bad no one's going to hear it. Okay, here we go. That is so funny. This was sponsored by contactmapping.com. We will give you a free book that is also on Amazon called The Copy Shop Interview. Just go to co uh, contactmapping.com forward slash CSI. It's there. You're going to love it. Five, four. And welcome back to the Network Marketing Leadership Show with Tom Chenault, Adrian Chenault, AndreNorman.com. 
and Troy Dooley. Dot no com. So <laughs> Andre wants to say something into response to a question that he anticipated from the ether. So well, is it racism? Is it police brutality? What is it, Andre? It's just, it's a way of life. To this day, when I drive down the street and I pass a police car on the side of the road, for the next mile, I'm in my mirror looking to see if he's coming off the shoulder. Yeah. Because I'm literally, I mean, that's not even a joke. That's in real time. That's yesterday. That's the day before. Because I don't know if he comes off that shoulder, if I'm going to get through this traffic stop. That's not just for the cameras. That's real life. And that's just in the life of black people. You know, when that cop comes off the shoulder, it could be all bad. Because you have no rights. You have no justice. And then let's make me George Floyd. And I've been for the last 20 years of my life teaching at Harvard, teaching at MIT, going to hunt Doris. I stopped the Ferguson riots. I've done a lot of stuff to make things better. But had that been me, the narrative today would have been ex-criminal, ex-gang member, violent guy. He must have done something. And the rest of the world would have been like, yeah, yeah, I, I could see that. And it had been done. So I don't believe every case is based on racism. But it's gonna lend to, it's gonna lend in that box once it's white cop black guy. If even if it is or isn't, it's gonna fall in that box. Just because like saying jocks are stupid. No, they're not. But if you say you're a jock, you're gonna be accused of not being smart. If cool. you're blonde and you're pretty, then you're not smart. So there's the stereotypical things that are always gonna fall into a box. And your son was saying, this is not rage. This is this is just how it's been since the boat landed some years ago. This is not this is just accepted life in the black community that white folks have the right to kill you. And it's it, as sending your babies outside, you don't know uh, three kids in the truck and see your son and just kill him just because. The guy was jogging in Georgia a couple weeks ago, and two guys just decided he looked like a burglar from two weeks ago. Not this morning. Nobody screaming they stole my purse. They ran him down, he ended up dying. And it was like, what happened? Oh, he looked like a burglar from two weeks ago. And the cops said, no problem, let him go home. You're telling me me and my cousin couldn't have killed the white man. The police pull up, we still got guns and say, oh, he looked like a burglar from two weeks ago. No problem, Dre, go home. Not gonna happen. So it's, I don't care about, I don't wanna stop racism. Let's be clear. You have the right to not like me because I'm black. You have the right to not like me for whatever the reason you don't want to like me. I don't need you to like me. Just don't kill me. I love that. In my you don't have to like me. I don't like everybody, but I don't have the right to kill you because I don't like you. So Stay away I'm, from me. Go move to Montana, but just don't join the police force and go work in an inner city and say you don't like black people. Defeats logic. Oh, man. You know, Tom, Adrian said something. I want to, I want to interview. He, he used the word fear. And I, and I think that is a 100% truth on both sides of this equation because I, I've got a great friend of mine, very successful, just like Dre. I mean, great guy. But he said, Troy, I've lived with fear all my freaking life. But yet white people are almost the same. The only reason I'm not fearful, I was a bounty hunter. I went into the community and pulled out criminals. It wasn't a black, white thing. I just pulled out bad guys. I got to know people very, very well. Most white people don't do that. They watch the news or they watch a movie from Hollywood. So all Mexicans have got to be lazy. All blacks must be in the drug dealing. All Italians must be bad gangsters. We watch this crap and then we become fearful inside. I think without even knowing it, it's a subliminal message that we have inside. And we got to figure out a way to stop this crap. Have you read this book? Go ahead. He said earlier during the break that, um, what were you saying? That the way we attacked um, the Me Too movement, is that going to be the same thing with dealing with racism? In the 70s, when I grew up, there was no such thing as domestic violence. You could beat up your wife. It was called handling your household. Oh, my gosh. I watched it. I lived it. And if the police happened to show up, they would tell my dad, listen, the neighbors called, keep it down. Domestic violence didn't exist in the 70s. Did not exist. It was non non-existent. And the same thing now, we have to say, we, I don't want to force people to love everybody. That might not be who you are. But let's say you don't have the right to kill the people that you don't like just because you don't like them. Great. There's enough places in this country that you can go to be around people that look just like you and think like you, but don't go to where you know they are 
and wonder why you're having an encounter. Now, what about a book called White Fragility? Have you ever heard of it? No, I haven't. Not that one. It's the second one. So I just want, is it, what would you read if you're me to give me some optic from where I stand of how to understand this in order to love like crazy, then love more and do what I can do to make this thing better. Love like crazy and understanding is two different things. Uh -huh, if you have love in your heart, you're going to love like crazy. Good. Understanding is a completely different animal. I would say there's a, people like listening to um, Martin Luther King. Go listen to Malcolm X. Listen to Malcolm X speeches because he speaks to the brutality that was suffered upon black people. He wasn't talking about let's make it right. He's like, hey, we're being beat. We're being, but again, black Muslim, hard to listen to. I'm saying, but other than you, you can get past the black Muslim part and say, let's listen to what he was saying and talking about. This is what he was speaking about throughout the 60s at one level, minus the religious part. That's definitely to hear the pain. It's not going to be the solution. He's going to speak only to the pain. His okay. solutions weren't um, the best of the best, but he definitely spoke to the pain. Andre, we love you. I cannot believe with 15 minutes notice you're sitting in a studio on this show because you care about this world so much. Troy Dooley, you the same way. Next week, we've got Rob Sperry on here, who's a beast in his own right. But I love you guys, and thank you very much for coming on the show. We'll see you next time. All right. Thank you, buddy. Unbelievable job, you guys. Andre, thank you, and... I want, I'm going to, I'm just going to get better. I mean, the network marketing world is word of mouth. I mean, it is a movement into itself. If we can get these people thinking like you and we're pro I want to call you back and you and I and burn off and Troy and Adrian do another show where we've got the whole show or more to get people to understand that we can as a complete group affect change. Cause let's face it. We got to start somewhere. Don't we? This, this is my thing. Throughout slavery, I'm sure if you took a poll of all the black people, they would agree that slavery needed to end. If you just said, hey, how you slaves feel about slavery? You want to end it or keep it going? They'd have all voted to end it. But that's Andre, not what ended Stand by one. What, Eric Worre, who's he's got 500,000 followers or a million followers or something like that. And he's talking about you because his family lives up in uh, Minneapolis and he's just heartbroken about what's going on. And he's talking, what's the name of your book? Because I want him to buy that. Ambassador of Hope. Ambassador of Hope. And I'm going to get, it's, and I'm going to share your information with him because he may want to do it. He's got a much bigger platform and what you've got going on deserves to be heard. So I'm going to make sure that happens. That's fine. But God bless you. If you, so, if you, if you polled the people who were slaves during slavery, they would have all voted to end it day one, but they weren't, they, their votes didn't count. What ended slavery was when Northern whites said enough. Whatever their reason was, it was Northern whites who stood up to Southern whites and started the end of slavery. It was never a tally of the vote of the people who were enslaved. So right now, black people are saying, we, you don't have a voice, let's keep it a hundred. You don't have a voice that matters at le one level. So let's stop pretending that Al Shopton makes a difference. He doesn't, you know what I'm saying? Jesse Jackson doesn't make a difference, they're clowns. So what I'm saying is Northern whites or the free whites or the people like yourselves need to stand up and say, yo, this is enough. We need to have a civil war at one level for the words over this subject. The same way we're not tolerating human trafficking, we're not tolerating killing the whales, we're not tolerating beating dogs, let's not tolerate killing black folks unjustly. So it was Northern whites who ended slavery, not the slaves. Who believe that? You, sir, and you taught at Harvard and at MIT. In London Business School. Unbelievable. His partner's from MIT, got a PhD from there. My wife wow, got a PhD awesome. from MIT in um, political science. I'll be darned. Isn't that nuts? Well, we love you guys. Thank you very much. Andre, we'll see you next you, time. Troy. Thank, thank you, you so much. You, Troy. That's All right.